without further ado, Brian Hunter. Hi, thank you. Uh, are we good with the mic? <coughs> are we good with the mic? Hello, Mike. Hello, Robert. Hello, Joe. All right. All right. So uh, there are going to be some slides in this talk uh, before we get started that didn't exist until I was talking with some of you all in the room here this week. So, uh, uh, so you all had questions about things as I was trying to do my hallway pitch on, the, on this thing. And so uh, there's some new content in here. <coughs> and, uh, and that sounds a little hot. So I'm going to move it just a bit back because I get kind of loud and excited. <coughs> so all right. So uh, hello, welcome to Waterpark Transforming Healthcare with Distributed Actors. My name is Brian Hunter, and it's a joy to be here to share some of the research that my team uh, has been uh, doing. And so we've got folks, uh, Patrick, and we've got Brad and Scott, and we've got a crew back in Nashville that couldn't make it. And so uh, we're going to be just celebrating this, this research. This research led to a product with an unusual architecture. Uh, it's quite different than a lot of Elixir apps out there, and it's way, way different than uh, non-Beam uh, applications out there. <coughs> and so uh, hopefully it'll give you some ideas. And this unusual architecture is out doing good in the world. And so it's, it's, it's helping people. And uh, I'm really proud of that and, and happy about that. And so I'm just, it's a joy to be here to share. Um, <coughs> So I'm an enterprise fellow at HCA Healthcare, and I'm not sure if you've heard of HCA, but HCA is big, really big. Uh, so HCA owns and operates 182 hospitals around the country, and then they offer some facilities in the UK, but that's a really a separate thing uh, from us. Um, so 182 hospitals, over 2,300 surgery centers, freestanding ERs, and clinics. I have 280. 3,000 colleagues around the country uh, that can send me an email, and some Mondays it feels like they did. And, uh, <coughs> and so with 35 million patient encounters each year, a lot of people truly depend on us doing things right. Uh, I, I saw a, a, a link somewhere, I think that HCA is around 6% of U.S. healthcare is a thing I saw on Wikipedia or some public site. Uh, and so I, I the one thing I can't share is internal numbers on things, and that's an external number. Uh, so, so about one in twenty, or more than you know, more than that uh, of healthcare in the United States is through HCA Healthcare. <coughs> so, back in 2017, I was presented with this research and development challenge within the Enterpri uh, Enterprise Integration Group, and the challenge was: given all the data and the Erlang VM, what good could we do? Could we improve patient outcomes? Could we help our caregivers, our nurses, our doctors, and if we put our hospitals uh, on better footing in the event of a disaster, natural disaster, or a pandemic? And so we weren't really expecting the pandemic, but <coughs> the pandemic came. <coughs> and then secondarily, we had some goals. Uh, could we just bring some joy to IT? And so for me, dev joy is being productive and having low friction ways of doing important work. And I. Uh, I'd say it nods in here, that would probably be what a lot of us would define, you know, dev joy. Um, uh, being able to get stuff done. And biz joy is around faster delivery and really about having lower risk and lower uncertainty. And that makes the business happy. And if you have observable fault tolerance systems with stress-free failure models and you don't have a pager going off on the weekend, then that provides ops joy. And so uh, I believe we've accomplished these things in the product, but these were initial goals. We had a, f uh, a few other <coughs> uh, top-level things that we'll go into, but that experimentation and proofs uh, that year uh, of 2017 seeded several useful projects, and one of those was Project Water Park. And the name comes from this idea. We, we'd heard uh, we didn't want to be another data lake or a data swamp. And we knew that this thing was going to be fast. It was going to have a lot of stuff flowing through all these tubes all over the place. And so, so Water Park seemed like a better name than, than you know, some businessy name. And so it had sort of a silly name, and it stuck. And it's, it's fun. Um, so we, um, to help patients and caregivers and our IT friends, one of the things we had to do is we had to be up. You know, we knew this from the very beginning in the R&D. And so uh, we knew that we, you know, this term of highly available, though, is subjective. And so to make it objective, we said, OK, instead of highly available, let's start off with the goal of being continuously available. No downtime ever. 
is what we were aiming at. And, <coughs> and next, um, in an organization, if, if it's hard to get access to the data you need, then teams are going to hoard that data, and there are going to be all these data silos popping up. But if you make publishing and subscribing to data easy, you make it easy uh, to use popular tools, popular you know, data formats of the decade, not something from you know, 30 years before, uh, then you're going to encourage uh, people to do the right thing. You get rid of the perverse incentive of, uh, that causes hoarding, and hoarding stops. And then next, could we make a place for teams to create experiments? Could we make it uh, so that trying new ideas would be fast, cheap, and low risk instead of you have a good idea, but you don't know if you want to spend all your political capital or all your actual capital uh, on, on this project and it fails and then you then have to move on to another company. So if we could make it super cheap for people to, to have a wild idea and, and prove out if it could save lives or help caregivers and so on, we wanted a place for that to happen. <coughs> and um, could we shine? Could we provide an example of what quality software can look like and how it can be built? And so uh, Erlang, Elixir, these are not the most common in big enterprises, uh, and so we, we, we wanted this thing to be a shining example. And so our practices and our, and our, uh, have basically aimed at this goal of shining. So let's get a view of what Waterpark is. So we run on a cluster of servers, and data comes in, and some data we just simply route out unchanged. And so we're an integration engine, and so some of the things actually just pass through us. <coughs> but sometimes we transform data, and so maybe data comes in over uh, uh, XML over REST, and we send it out as JSON over a Kafka topic. And so, you know, that's simple enough transformations. And then other signals are generated entirely within Waterpark. So this big stream of all the data coming in, we're able to infer meaning from these messages and generate signals that didn't exist until, the uh, until it all came together inside of uh, uh, this system. Okay, so Waterpark, we play a lot of bases. We're an integration engine, we're a streaming system, a distributed database, a content delivery network, or a CDN, a cache, a queue, a complex event processor, and a function as a service platform. So by implementing from scratch in Elixir, the minimal set of features that we needed from, say, a cache or a queue meant we didn't have to take hard dependency on something like Redis. Uh, we didn't have to depend on some other software. And Waterpark, you know, we, we don't even use a database. And this kind of blows people's mind. You know, there's no Ecto in Waterpark. We don't use a database. There's no Postgres or Cassandra. Waterpark is a database. It's a distributed globally, or uh, uh, geographically fault-tolerant, RAM-based, never-touches-disk embedded database. And so uh, that also makes it unusual, I think, uh, in, in the list of apps that you maybe have encountered. <coughs> uh, this I believe deeply. I, I think uh, we are obsessed with reuse and uh, it's, it's an absolute sickness. Uh, and so, um, so uh, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, th this, is, this is why Waterpark is able to do what it's doing. So investing a few months in building a tailor fit subset of the features that we truly needed let us avoid dependencies. And dependencies, even if they're free, they're not really free. So Apache might be free, it's not really free. Because now, by implementing these things, our deployment and failure models are our own. We don't have a weird model of what Apache this project liked and, and this. and th We have our deployment model and our failure model. And this has been a key to Waterpark having zero downtime, not a millisecond of downtime since we went to production over three years ago. So as virtuous as wheel reinvention can be, and I'm a big fan of this, uh, you know, you need to know when you're inventing the universe, and you don't want to do that. Um, and so distinguishing between the two is important. So invent, reinvent the wheels that aren't good enough for the car you're driving. Um, 
So for Water Park, we didn't reinvent hardware. We chose simple one-use servers with onboard disks and no shared storage. We expect our servers to fail. Uh, they're the cheapest boxes that we could get purchased. Um, and, um, and we did everything we could so that that box, when it catches on fire, the fire is contained within that one U uh, uh, slot. And, um, and we'll see more about that design as we go. And we also didn't write a language or an operating system, uh, but we chose a less conventional operating system, the Erlang VM. And so a lot of you might not actually think of the Erlang VM as an operating system, but it straight up is an operating system. Uh, it takes these things over on the right. These are things that the Erlang VM is doing for you that uh, operating systems do. And you can run the Erlang VM directly on bare metal. We are not doing that. We don't need to. But it's an operating system. And it gives us some superpowers. So on a single commodity server, we run millions of actor processes, massive concurrency. These actors auto balance across the cores. And we get soft real time without even thinking about it. We, we you know, it just happens. And talking to an actor across the country is no more difficult in our code than talking to an actor that's on the same server. It's just slower because light and physics. Um, but it's not harder. And the Erlang VM is this special purpose operating system that was built around the actor model, and that fit us really, really well. <coughs> so uh, Carl Hewitt introduced the uh, uh, actor model in 1973, and it's this model of concurrent computation inspired by physics. There's a brilliant talk out on the Erlang Solutions site uh, where uh, Carl Hewitt and Joe Armstrong are up on a stage together along with Tony Hoare. And it's, uh, it's, you all just have to check it out. I, I can't spend the time to go into it, but search it. It's really beautiful. Um, so in this model, actors are the fundamental element, and these actors interact through message passing. <coughs> so for many of you, this is going to be review, but uh, sometimes I bump into Elixir developers that we're interviewing, and they don't know this stuff after like three or four years because they came through a different path. So people that came from Erlang would just know this, and people that came from Ruby or from Node or something along this line, maybe not. Maybe it was, you, know, you, you came in for the Phoenix path. But so we'll just talk about some of this because some of it's important to the rest of the talk. We'll talk about Erlang VM's actor and process model. So every actor process has some props, and we're going to use the word actor and Erlang VM process, and even another term, digital twin. We're going to use those interchangeably uh, in this talk. So we have these props. So each actor process has its own dedicated, isolated, share nothing memory. So within this little box of your process, nothing's going in there and wiggling your state. And so this memory, it starts off tiny, two kilobytes on a 64-bit machine. And inside of that, we have a stack and a heap. And as our actor runs and accumulates state, it grows following, I think the Fibonacci series is maybe the, the what, it, what it does, I, I believe now. But so it grows and grows as it's needed. And then after it grows and it's not needed, we then have the idea of a garbage collector. But in uh, Erlang VM, each actor process also gets its own dedicated garbage collector. So let that sink in for just a second. We've got hundreds of thousands of processes running on a box, and each one of them has their own isolated garbage collector. Then think about the job that it's actually having to do. We're on this operating system where, Erlang VM, operating system where all of the languages that run on this operating system are functional. Code can't mutate state. You can't mutate you know, memory. You, and you also can't have shared state between processes. You can't wiggle and change the process another process's memory. So it's not a bad place to get a job being a garbage collector. <laughs> and, um, and so we, we get these tiny deterministic GCs on the Erlang VM, and we don't get the availability killing stop the world GCs that you might expect if you're in the JVM or .NET CLR land, if you come from that background. And we just get this for free. Also, on the Erlang VM, every process has its own dedicated mailbox. And it's good that it does because it's the only way that a process can talk to the world at all. Even when you write to the file system, you are sending a message to another process's mailbox. When you do file write, file read, this is all message passing. It's all abstracted from you behind the API, but it's all processes. You cannot touch and do side effects without using messages. And so um, to uh, other processes or to the outside world, and so it's absolutely lonely being an Erlang or Elixir process. 
now from links and monitors. Um, we can tell the Erlang VM that we want to know immediately if some other process, same server or a server across the cluster at another data center, it crashes. So a link is like a death pact. It's Thelma and Louise. It's, uh, you know, we're driving over the bluff with you. You die, I'm going with you. And this other idea of monitors is more like reading the obituaries. It's like, I care, you know, uh, I'll grieve, but I'll carry on, you know. Uh, and um, so th these low-level operating system level messages, these Erlang VM messages, um, uh, are used to build these higher level things that we all use, such as supervisor trees. And so these primitives are what makes that possible. Now let's take a look at process scheduling. <coughs> We have a single CPU core here, and we have a single scheduler. And so you can think of a program as a series of operations. The Erlang VM scheduler gives each process, each one of those little blocks that are going through there, gives each one of them 2,000 operations to perform, and then immediately it removes the talking stick from that process and then gives the talking stick to the next process and gives it 2,000 reductions and so on. And there's no way that any actor can take more than 2,000 reductions. That's all it gets. There are no hogs, and there's near, near zero context switching cost as it goes from process to process. And that is not the way it works with Linux threads or with Windows threads. You're talking about tens of thousands of CPU operations just burning and creating heat as it's trying to lock down this thread, keep it from being naughty and slapping its hand to get it away from the core. That is not what happens here. It's almost zero as it's moving from process to process. And so we get this buttery smooth soft real-time processing as a result of it. And it's just beautiful. If you have two cores, you get two schedulers and it's doing this and uh, the work is balanced across those cores and so on. And, um, and just one bit of trivia, this is actually done as a PowerPoint animation. Like there, there's no GIF here, there's no video. This is, this is the most insane bit of PowerPoint ever. So, <laughs> so. <coughs> It's sort of sick, uh, but uh, so, and, and as a note, uh, water parks, uh, one use servers, there are 56 logical cores in these boxes, and so we have 56 schedulers uh, running on each one of our servers out there doing this, and so. So with this common understanding of the Erlang VM um, actor model, we can move on to healthcare now. So we use the Erlang VM processes, our actors, to represent each patient as a digital twin. talking about an actor process per patient and not a database row per patient. More typical healthcare systems, a patient is represented as a moment in time snapshot of data, whether this is HL7 messages, table rows, JSON, on disk usually. And um, most systems, they read patient data, they perform some work based on the current values and they flush their buffers like a goldfish, they don't remember anything that happened just a moment before, and they move on to the next data. So in Water Park, though, we model each patient as this long-running patient actor. And so currently, we're modeling millions of patient actors on our cluster. So there are millions of humans that have these digital twins that are modeled real-time right now uh, on these servers scattered around the country. So a patient actor represents and is dedicated to one individual human patient. So these patient actors, they run from pre-admit to post-discharge, maybe for several weeks, and, and actually for a minimum of 21 days, because uh, we, we basically evict a patient from water park if we haven't seen a message from that patient in 21 days. And so every time a new message comes in, we reset the timer. And so we, we, uh, early in uh, the deployment of water park, we had actors that had been up and running for six months because they were sick patients that would keep on coming back. You know, they were having follow-up visits. <coughs> and, so, um, and so a patient actor is not limited to the data and the latest HL7 message passing into it. It holds every message and event that led to the current state of that patient actor. And so maybe this is thousands of messages. So again, on the, uh, er, six months in, we looked and we had some patients out there that had 50,000 messages that were accumulated on them. It was like, huh, that's interesting. <laughs> and so we just, you know, but the system was running fine. So, um, In healthcare, there's this idea, if any of you have uh, family members that are nurses or doctors, you know of the long shift. So not, nurses often work these 12-hour shifts or longer to provide continuity of care for patients and to reduce the frequency of dangerous handoffs. And here's the why. 
Here's from the Joint Commission. I'll highlight the words that are important here. <clears throat> that 80% of serious medical errors are around miscommunication, the handoffs, and then transitioning of care. So it is dangerous as you're going at a shift change. And so you have one last shift change if you have 12-hour shifts instead of 8-hour shifts. So patient actors extend this long shift idea by providing continuity of care for our clinical systems. <clears throat> so this gives us better context and awareness of the full visit of our patients. <clears throat> so this awareness it enables real-time no uh, real notifications and alerts based on days or weeks or months, really, of events like transfers, drugs administered, procedures, lab results, and so on. So to a little visual uh, to make this. Uh, so here we have uh, uh, a facility with two patients in it. We have patient 1001. And so in Water Park, we're going to receive patient events as HL7 messages, <coughs> other kinds too, but uh, a lot of healthcare is around HL7. And we're going to create a patient per, um, uh, per we're going to, uh, a patient actor per patient to process those messages. So we come through here, this flows through, and we say, hey, anywhere in the cluster, do we have patient 1001? No? Let's spin it up. And then once we spin it up, we then apply that message to it, and it does whatever inference it needs to on that message, and, and there we go. And another message comes through, <coughs> and it's like, do we have this actor? Yes, there it is. It routes it to that actor. <coughs> so now we have an aspirin order. And this other patient, same thing, it spins up. We have an admit. And then another one comes back through here. We can see this transcript being built up here. Uh, of all the messages that have happened for that patient. And we also have this idea of, we know that this one patient, there's only one patient actor on the entire cluster that represents this human. And so we don't have to then think about uh, like concurrency issues. It's all being serialized. So all of Brian Hunter, I stubbed my toe, all of Brian Hunter's uh, messages are going through my actor somewhere on the cluster. And so there aren't two of me out there. So we've mentioned HL7 and HL7 messages. We talked about this a few times. Um, so let's take a peek at what healthcare messages look like. Okay, you might put your you know hand up a little bit here. It's not pretty. <coughs> so, yeah, ah, it burns. Yeah. So this is HL7, <coughs> a really old standard, and you'll hear it called PiPat because of the pipes and those little carrots. Uh, and so this is PiPat uh, or HL7. And to make it just a little bit easier to see. I uh, put some space between each of the segments, and I've highlighted the segment, uh, uh, the segment names. And so this message has message header, they always do, and then they have this EVN PID and so on. And so if we're going through this, we'd say MSH3 is the sending app. MSH4 is the sending facility for this message. Receiving app, facility, message date, type, ID, and version, and so on. And so this is, these are HL7 paths. This is a, a notation that you use for this. <coughs> okay? So... We knew that dealing with HL7 was going to be critically important, and so in the early, early proofs, we built, uh, started building an HL7 library in Elixir. And we needed this library. We built it, and i um, proud that HCA allowed us to take this out and uh, open it up for the community. It's out there under the MIT license, and it's, uh, within the company, there's a lot of talking about volunteering and caring for the community, and it, this was a, an interesting approach for them. They had never really thought of software that way. And so we're raising all boats, and we're giving one more good reason for healthcare companies to use Elixir. And so that's cool. Let's take a quick peek at this thing. So message, we'll load HL7 message of this HL7 text. Uh, we'll see what that looks like. It creates this struct. So message, query, new, query, get part, AL13.2 is the notation, and we're going to get aspirin back from there. So that's how the library works. On top of that, we thought, hey, this would be really cool. Uh, we're doing lots of research. We're in this research and development phase. And we thought, how about if we use bloom filters and scalable bloom filters? And so um, a scalable bloom filter is this probabilistic data structure that supports two things. It allows you to add items to the bloom filter. And it allows you to say, hey, have I ever added this item to you, bloom filter? Is it a member? So it's, you can sort of think of it as a map set, but it's not actually storing your values. It's probabilistic. It's tiny amount of memory that it's holding. And so, but out of this structure, there's a guarantee. There's no false negatives uh, that come out of it. If you ask, uh, if you put something into the bloom filter and you ask, uh, it'll never tell you no if you've put the item into the bloom filter. Now, it may tell you 
yeah, I've seen that one before, when it really hasn't. Uh, and so that's a false positive. And you can configure in a scalable bloom filter your rate of false positive. And so the, the more false positives you get, the smaller the data structure will be. The, the fewer false positives, the bigger. And so you make a trade-off here. And so this is basically what's underlying you know, search engines, you know, th this, this idea here. And so what you do is you, you use the, uh, a probabilistic data structure to get you to the neighborhood, and then you're able to do like expensive, more brute force things once you're there, or other techniques once you're in the neighborhood. And you're then able to do super fast things. So, and so with a scalable bloom filter, you can say, okay, as I add more and more items to this, r rather than it getting less and less accurate, I want you to just grow the memory slightly each time you need to. And so, so this is a great book uh, by uh, Andre uh, Gakov that is just just full of all sorts of gems in here. And so I, I'd recommend getting this. And uh, so bloom filters, how are we going to use this here? So. We've got our actor uh, patient 1000 bloom filter. So we add, and so here we're going to add a string of uh, AL1, the HL7 path, and then aspirin. And we might add diagnosis code 1, 3.1, and we're going to give it the code for chest pain unspecified here. And then we might add in um, uh, zip code, uh, PID 11.5, the zip code. And we could go through and we could walk for each one of these messages, we could walk through and add the path and the value for each, each single thing, and this would then be the basis of an advanced search. Where you could say, every, give me everything that has in this zip code. And you've done it off of this super cheap uh, indexing scheme. And on the right, we at the same pass, this processing exactly once processing, we have, we're getting full text indexing by doing <laughs> just a second calculation at that same time. Okay, so that's cool, we say is member, uh, we say uh, this birthday of 19, in 1962, sure enough, uh, it's true. And we say is member of Birmingham, yeah, it's true. And we say is member of SARS-CoV-2, it says false. It says false because COVID didn't, wasn't a thing when we were doing this work. You know, we're off playing. And all of a sudden the world got really, really serious, really fast. And so we dropped some things like that where they were at, and we had this instead. In three weeks, we need to take water park to production. In other words, in three weeks, you'll never again be able to take downtime. Continuous availability, which means no unplanned outages, no planned outages. To get there, you have to follow this, this idea of no masters. You can't have a single point of failure and have a highly available system. <coughs> So let's look at some patterns here. This is a common thing you see. Task router uh, that's out talking to three worker nodes. Well, it's a bad plan because you have a single point of failure there. <coughs> if the task router goes down, nothing's happening. Uh, even more common is this. You've got worker nodes out there talking to shared storage or to a database. Database goes down, everyone's just sort of dead in the water. So this, uh, let's look at this. This is, uh, you'll hear this called roles and series, and uh, you'll also hear it called the N-tier architecture. And you'll hear it called by people on my team as the worst high ability plan ever. <laughs> because if your business logic tier fails and your database, you're totally down. I mean, it, it is the most insane model that everyone got shipped into it, like all the kind of cult things that we got mapped into in the, in the 90s and early aughts about all these patterns and practices, and they're just toxic. And so, but, I mean, people don't question some of this. Uh, and so, anyway, uh, off my rant. Uh, so, what's the problem here? So, if we have a component that's three nines of availability, we're going to get 8.8 .8 hours of downtime a year off that component. So here on the left, we have in series, and uh, if any of those components fail, we're down. And on the right, we have them in parallel. And so if any of those three are up, we're good. So here we get, this multiplies out, and we get 26 hours of downtime per year off that same uh, quality of component. And over here, we get 32 milliseconds per year. So we liked that. We liked the three to the side. <laughs> um, and, and so, but what we liked even more is like, how about eight? You know, what if we had eight things instead of three things? Like, how many nines do we get out of that? And, and what if we put between them uh, a little line, and we said, if, 
these, whatever could kinetically, like knock these servers onto the ground, catch fire, whatever, network goes weird. Could we put some sort of break here around availability zones so that a fire that happens here will leave four of our servers up and then we'll still have really good uh, numbers as far as our uh, availability on the other half? That seemed like a good idea. So we did that and we extended that even one more level and said, uh, let's do that same thing across the country in four geographically uh, isolated places. And so here's our cluster. This is what Waterfork looks like. We're 32 nodes, and we're not 32 nodes because we need that much compute or we need that, I mean, we're running at really low compute, uh, like 4% CPU and like 2% memory or something like that, and we're processing all of the messages real time. Uh, so that's not why we did this. We did this around high availability. And so every node is a worker, and every node is storage, and all are peers, and there are no masters here. The only difference between any of these nodes, no special capabilities, the only difference is their node name. That is the only thing that breaks symmetry across our cluster. <coughs> Process pairs. Process pairs was a technique used by Jim Gray in the design of the fault-tolerant tandem computer. And the process pairs idea was adopted early in the design of Erlang. So Joe was a fan of, of this. And here's Joe Armstrong, the father of Erlang. Uh, he says, to be fault tolerant, nodes in a cluster must be able to detect other nodes crashing. Remember the links and monitors bit from earlier? Well, that's how that works. And they must have sufficient data to take over for a down node, and users should not notice the failure. So when people come to the Erlang VM, a lot of times they bump into OTP and they have some assumptions that end up not being really true. Uh, they, okay, so supervi uh, supervisor starts a child, we process has no data, we get some data, we get some more data, and then the process crashes, and then the process restarts because they're a supervisor and our process has no data. And, and uh, so uh, there's an intuitive sort of break here where you're like, oh hey, I thought the supervisor would bring back my data. And that's just not the way it works. And so you'd see threads. Uh, back in the old Erlang mailing list about this, and so this guy writes this email. I'll, I'll go ahead and make it easier to read here by, by putting in the slides. And so, so, and so Joe responds to this guy and says, in 2011, saying, I think you're getting confused between OTP supervisors and the general notion of takeover. Let's start with how we do error recovery. Imagine two linked processes, A and B, <coughs> on separate machines. A is the active process. B is a passive process that will take over if A fails. A sends a stream of state update messages, S1, S2, S3, to B. The state messages contain enough information for B to do whatever A was doing should A fail. If A fails, B will receive an exit signal. If B receives an exit signal, it knows A has failed. So it carries on doing whatever A was doing using the information it lost, uh, it last received in the state update messages. And so this is basically what Tandem Computer is doing, and this is the early days of Erlang, and this is what we're doing. So I stub my toe, and I go into uh, the ER uh, at, in Nashville at Centennial Medical Center. And so there's going to be some process that spins up on our cluster that represents me. It might be in Florida, it might be in Utah, uh, we don't care, uh, it's going to be somewhere. And this is the writer process for me, this is the one that accepts writes. And we're also, when that writer spins up, we're going to spin up a read replica at that data center, and then a read replica at each of the other data centers. And so we're going to have five copies of every message that we receive. <coughs> now before we return an ACK, we're going to guarantee that we have written to three of our five. So the writer has it and two other readers, which gives a guarantee that we know that the data exists on two data centers. So is like a millisecond after we return an ACK, an asteroid comes in and hits Florida and, and smashes our data center. That ACK, whoever received that ACK, they know that their message hasn't been lost. Even though we'd only returned the ACK one millisecond before and it's vaporized, we didn't lose the message. And this is a guarantee that, our, uh, uh, that other apps at the company do not make. This is, you know, uh, and, and this blows people's mind. 
and this is just the way we operate. Um, now, uh, to show you what happens, say if A2 catches on fire or Brad reboots it because he's always doing that because you know he, he just likes to torture the servers. And uh, so uh, A2 is down here. Well, what happened to Brian Hunter's writer process? Well, our topology changes because we notice, okay, there are fewer servers here, our topology changes, and so we then spin it up somewhere else. And so there it is, and it recovers state from the nearest best reader. Okay, so how is it we know where those processes should live? Why did I live on A2 and then on A3 and those readers were over there? It's really around server hash rings. And so we use hash rings, in particular we use lib ring by Bitwalker. It's, a, you know, it's really nice. Uh, and so we don't rewrite everything, we just write thi we rewrite things if we would take a hard dependency that would hurt us. And, and that's nice and small code and, it's, uh, and, and it works for us. So here's what that looks like. Hash ring, new, hash ring, add nodes. So we add our eight servers at a data center, and there we go. And we could then map hash ring, a key, a actor key of 1001, and it's gonna always map to server S S7, deterministic. Every single time you call, it's gonna always map to S7, unless we change the number of, uh, of, of nodes in that ring, that would be a way it would change. But other than that, it's always gonna be the same, and it doesn't matter which server you're standing on, you're always gonna get the same answer. So this is around, uh, so we're not just using hashing, like phash32, uh, uh, we're using consistent hashing. And so here's the paper about this from May 97. Um, and uh, there are two papers out there, rendezvous hashing and consistent hashing. We end up using consistent hashing, but they're both really interesting and they're worth looking at. Um, but I think this is really nice. Uh, so uh, consistent hash function is one which changes minimally as the range of the function changes, and then at the bottom here they say, may eventually prove useful in the applications such as distributed name servers and or quorum systems. <laughs> and so it's like, yep, you got it. You guys, uh, you, you saw that one from 97. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, um, so given a key and, and uh, with consistent hashing of actor key 1001, each server assigns, or each of the nodes, each of these servers are gonna assign a key to that, uh, a score to that key. And so the server scoring the highest will own that key. So in this case, uh, we can see that S7 had a 94 and those others had lower. And so even when servers drop, we don't have to recalculate and, and have everything migrate around, which would be really expensive. Um, because we lose two nodes over here and 94 is still the highest number. So the value just stays there. Now, if we had values on S2 or S3, they'd of course have to move somewhere else, but these other values, they don't have to move just because nodes went away. And so this keeps a lot of churn from happening. Really, really clever, yeah. And uh, so math is good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So uh, topology, get DCs. Topology, get DC hash ring of Tennessee. We say get the current topology, we get this. Get actor server of a particular key, and it'll go off here. And it doesn't matter which one of these nodes we're standing on, they're all gonna say that that key maps to Tennessee B2. And the reason they all say that is they all share the same topology. If they didn't share, if all these nodes didn't share that one bit of information, they couldn't do this. We'd have to do some crazy thing like a distributed registry, where we would spin up a process somewhere and we'd have to register it, and then replicate, oh, we just spun up this, process here and it's registered on this server and then replicate that to all of our peers and then when it died we'd have to let them know that and it'd be millions of these processes in this super super expensive so we wanted a globally consistent process registry but that was too expensive our solution math and so by by this by having this instead of saying process lives here let's record where you live instead of that saying Hey, process, what's your, uh, what's your ID? Oh, you have to live here. You, you, uh, your ID means that you live on that server. By changing the, 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 the order there, it means that all we have to do now is have strong consensus on topology, tiny little data structure. And then we can route to the local process registry, which is fast and cheap, and we don't ne then need a global registry. So that is huge. Uh, location transparency. So here's Joe again. He makes a lot of appearances in this talk. Um, 
However it works in the distributed case is how it should work locally. And so this is a powerful idea on the Erlang VM, and Joe is the biggest champion of this that there ever was. A lot of people, even at Ericsson at the time, you know, they weren't really sure about this whole distributed Erlang thing. And you still hear people, but Joe was always convinced of this, and I trust Joe. Uh, and so super powerful idea, and this is one of the reasons that Waterpark is built on the beam. So to extend location transparency from the actor level to the node servers, we introduced a mailroom. <coughs> and so we'll walk through just some slides talking about how, uh, so a message has come in. So each node is a peer, as we said. A uh, message comes in, it hits a node, and any node can receive that message. You don't have to know which node, we can use load balancers, it can go into any random box, it's okay. No one on the outside knows or cares about the cluster, hash rings, registries, etc. Each node has a mailroom. The mailroom knows the topology. Inbound messages are routed through the mailroom to the appropriate patient actor. If the patient is remote, the mailroom routes the message to the remote node's mailroom. So, boop. If the patient is, uh, and um, if the topology changes in flight, so as that went over, uh, the world changed, the mailroom will then reroute that message to the correct mailroom. It's like, oh well, mistakes happen. And it routes it over to the correct one. And then that local mailroom is then gonna deliver that message to the correct patient actor on its server. And so, there we are. See the admit. So a mailroom, it provides this really nice seam for testing. We don't have to do any sort of crazy integration stuff or where we're standing up uh, like clusters inside of our integration tests. Uh, we can actually unit test these things. And so we have this nice, easy seam here. We can mock the mailroom. Uh, we have a, a place to bundle data and where we can compress data, hide the icky bits of RPC, and we can even change the mechanism underneath this. So today we're distributed Erlang. This whole cluster of 32 is using distributed Erlang for every bit of the communication between the nodes. But we, if we wanted to, we could replace this with uh, channels. Uh, we could replace this, or we could, we could say, let's use both. Let's use distributed Erlang and let's use sockets. And let's use, you know, gRPC or you know whatever it doesn't really matter and we can just replace that out and we can have a fraction of it to go to different network cards using different protocols and so uh, that's pretty cool and you don't have to change any of the other bits because they all go through that central mailbox or mailroom <coughs> so another thing Joe would talk about a lot you'd, you'd hang out with him for any amount of time and he would talk about you've got to state your invariance so I'm gonna state our invariance <coughs> Every patient actor has a key. Every patient actor is registered by key on its node's registry. Every patient actor is supervised. Commands are delivered to a patient actor via the mailroom. If a patient actor is not running when a command is delivered, it will be started. And if the topology is changed and a patient actor's key no longer maps to its current node, it will migrate to the correct node. Every patient actor has one read only follower process pair at each data center. Patient actor processes commands and emits events. Before a patient actor commits an event to its event log, two of its four read-only followers must acknowledge receipt of the event. Thus, we're protected from asteroids. When a patient actor starts, it will ask via the mailroom if its four read-only followers have state. And if they do, it says, oh, I must have crashed. I must be a crashed writer, and it will recover from its best reader. Each patient actor's state contains its key and event store and a map for event handler plugins to store projections. So how do we get this stuff out to our servers? So we do these things. Uh, so we use regular OTP releases, but we also use hot code loading. And we don't just use it every once in a while. We use we hot code load our, our cluster two, three times a week. Since we, so over the last three years, and if we did not use hot code loading, we would not have been able to be up three years. Uh, we would have had downtime. Uh, and we also use dark launches a lot and this idea of universal servers and plugins. And I'll show you that uh, this coming up. So OTP releases. This is funny. Our rolling deployment, this is like the traditional sort of way you deploy, was originally set up as our chaos testing scheme. So we would just drop nodes and then see if, if after the nodes came back up, if they would recover all their state from the, their peers on the network. Because again, they're not loading from disk anywhere. There's no centralized place. They have to heal off of their peers on the network. 
And so our initial go of this wasn't to deploy. It was, and so all we did in our deployments is we added the idea of pushing a new deployment out and then restarting the servers. And so that was all that we, you know, it's pretty, you know, pretty brutal, but it kept this honest. And so hot code loading for us. And so if, if you aren't familiar with this, this is just a, a super power crazy sharp tool, but a powerful tool in the Erlang VM. So we have uh, four modules out here. And there are three processes that are running code that's scattered across those four modules. And they're out there just bumping along as processes. And this third module down there, we realized we we're going to make an enhancement or we're going to fix a bug in that thing. And we need it to happen on all the services at the same time. And we need, we need, not, you know, we need to not to do a deployment. We've got to do this fast or for whatever reason. And so we're going to do this as a hot code deployment. So what we're going to do is we're going to just drop a new beam file out that, uh, for, for module three. And what's going to happen is on the next external call from these processes, the next time they call that, they're going to just reload that beam file and they'll keep on running. So the, the Erlang VM didn't restart. Those processes didn't even restart. It's just the next external call into a function in those modules picked up the code from the new beam. So what that looks like is much less dramatic here. Uh, we, we have patch date, and we say deploy, and it kind of looks like that. Because, <laughs> you know, it's just like, boop, and it hits everywhere at the same time. And so uh, we use that. Uh, so, and, and here's, this is not exactly what's there, but this is, this is, th this is what it, how it works. And so we're loading the, the object code from a module, and then we're calling the mailroom and sending and telling the mailroom on the other side to do a load library of that new binary. And that new binary gets dropped out there. And so there are two versions of that beam running on the server. And each external call will go to the new uh, beam that's out there. And so that's just the way it works. Um, that's the way it's worked since the 80s. <laughs> uh, early 90s, anyway. Yeah, early 80s, I guess. And so uh, uh, dark launches. So this idea is very similar. We do a deployment, but the features we're pushing out there are just latent. We have a component. It's out there, fully functional, but it's just turned off. And all we're really doing here is we're pushing config to a file so that if the node bounces, the file will be there and it will pick up the new config. And then we're also putting the config and the application put in out here. And we basically are flipping a switch and dark launching a feature that's been running on that server. Fine, we've maybe done AB comparison, but now we're going to make it real. It's going to be a real boy. <coughs> Universal servers. So Joe dri describes here his favorite Erlang program. And he says, I, uh, Got an Erlang process up here. It's going to take a message. You send a message to it, but instead of something like a hi, Joe, or something like that message, you're going to instead send a message that has instructions, instructions on how to become a different kind of server. And so you send a message to it and tell it how to become an HTTP server, and that do nothing server becomes, a universal server becomes an HTTP server or becomes an FTP server. And so we like that idea. And as COVID hit, Waterpark went to production. We knew. We needed a way to turn patient actors into a universal server that could be extended and changed dynamically at runtime with no downtime. So in that three weeks that we had, we weren't formatting code and we, <laughs> we weren't doing a whole, we weren't writing, you know, what we were doing is this. We were building this universal server idea into Waterpark so that we could push use cases out because we knew they were going to be hitting us fast. And so we implemented this plugin system, uh, and, and, and we really use that plugin system instead of what I showed in the hot code loading. And it, it makes the hot code loading a little bit safer, the way we bundle things in into it, because we knew that we'd be doing a lot of that. And so um, here's uh, what a patient actor looks like. We've got this in, uh, endless event stream coming through. And so they have keys and projections, and they have an event store. And they also have a collection of, uh, of plugins that are Maybe they're at deploy time, or maybe they've been loaded in dynamically. And uh, then we have the contract that each one of our event handlers has, the actor's key, the existing projections, the message that you need to process, the history of all the messages that this has ever seen. And then we're going to return the projections and then the side effects back. And so we have a pure function here. And so as a result of this, these event handlers, which are full of complex logic, we can then put property-based testing around these things. You know, we just wire this thing and we blast it with thousands and thousands of iterations of testing all the edge cases and lots of testing goes in here because this is a messy place where the business, so there's other bits, the system bits, you know, we kind of understand those, we can write unit tests. This is stuff where you don't even know what's going to happen. 
and it's really nice to have property testing. And so here's an example of one of those. So, so far, this has been a talk about how, and here's the why it matters. You know, so early in the pandemic, we deployed a patient actor plugin to immediately notify facility caseworkers anytime a patient who had transferred from a nursing home had tested positive for COVID. This allowed early contact tracing and quarantines um, could reduce the virus spread then within these extremely vulnerable communities. And so this was our first real deal. Uh, this is what we went out with. So our rules, they from a nursing home, is there a lab order, we have a result. So messages come through and we spin up this patient actor. And then maybe um, an hour later we might get a message that says, hey, uh, we found an admit source in this and it was a skilled nursing facility or it was a long-term care facility. And we get another message maybe two hours later on this process that's been up and running representing, you know, uh, uh, representing a, a patient. And uh, it's like, is there a COVID-19 lab order? Yes. Do we have a result? Maybe 12 hours later. Is it a COVID positive result? Yes. And then what we do is we'd send this alert out and then the calls would happen. And then they would make sure that whoever that patient had been hanging out with, at the nursing facility, they, they'd be able to keep an eye on people and, and try to keep people safe. And so, so this is one where, um, <coughs> this one kind of chokes me up. Um, and, and it never happens whenever I'm practicing. <laughs> but every time I get up here, it always, it always chokes me up. So, <coughs> So Joe passed away in April of 2019, and then about a year later, his ideas are out there, making all the nursing homes in the country safer than they would have been. And, you know, at the time, you know, my, my mom was actually in one of these um, skilled nursing facilities, and, you know, I was just, just thinking, you know, thanks, Joe. Um, here, here's one that uh, is, is also it's, it's doing a lot of good here, uh, the bariatric alerts. <coughs> Another plug-in, same idea, Joe can take credit for this one too. Um, <coughs> so uh, there's a real problem with bariatric patients that people just aren't aware of. A and uh, it, when they arrive at an emergency department, you know, if they're unable to communicate their history of having a bariatric procedure, maybe it's four years before, five years, you know. If they show up, though, and they've had this bariatric procedure, they're an increased risk of thiamine deficiency. And thiamine deficiency, uh, when it's severe, is deadly. It can kill you. It can cause permanent brain damage. You can be a vegetable. And, and just absolute awful thing about it is the diagnosis of it, if you don't know that this history is there, you wouldn't suspect thiamine deficiency. The symptoms look a whole lot like dehydration or hypoglycemia. And the treatment for hypoglycemia would be put someone on an IV bag and fill them for sugar, which makes the thiamine levels drop even faster. So this is a deadly, deadly thing. And you know how would you possibly know about this? So it's like, well, you should be able to connect to the hospital that had this record, right? It doesn't work that way. We're, we're healthcare is this industry where a, a lot of the tools were built by vendors from the 60s. They were proprietary. There's vendor lock-in. They don't want to share anything. They stifle innovation. And everything about it is hard. And so uh, the records aren't shared between hospitals, even within the same hospital chain. It's really hard to get these things back and forth. So what we do is we build up on top of the EMR and Waterpark is filling in this gap of innovation uh, that the EMRs don't provide. So here's this rule. We say newly admitted patient. And so we do this expensive lookup against a, uh, every patient actor that comes in. So our millions of patient actors, each one we check and we say, hey, 
uh, has this patient ever been admitted to any of other facilities? We do this lookup and we take that facility MRN and we find out have they ever, off of this matching of social security numbers and all this, we see all the places they've ever been that we know of. We get that big list back and then we say, has this patient, any of those patients, uh, any of that list of 12 facilities that we've seen them at, do any of those appear on a big bariatric registry from this old crusty system that no one wants to query, but we query because it's important, and we pull it in, and if we find these checks here, we let uh, uh, the caregivers know. We update the EMR, we put a record into the EMR, and we actually notify the caregivers directly as well. And so this thing is out there, no doubt, saving lives. Uh, and so that's pretty cool. And this is the latest one. This is one that's in pilot right now. Uh, it's at a pilot facility, organ donor alerts. So uh, when a, a patient comes in and they have um, a, uh, they're an organ donor, and they have certain scores on the, on the Glasgow Coma Scale, which means you know, they're, they're brain dead or you know, they're about to die, and they're an organ donor, uh, what should happen then is the caregiver, the nurses, should contact an organ procurement organization so that they can start arranging all the people that are waiting for organs to be able to get these organs so they're not wasted. Turns out this doesn't happen. Uh, it happens really way late. Uh, so we put this event, uh, this, this handler in, and uh, Water Park now looks for the same things that the nurses should be looking for, and we contact the organ procurement organization, and, and the nurses also contact them. And it turns out the gap, we notify 90 hours earlier than a nurse does. And, and we were floored by this number. It's like, how? And it's, here's the how. So um, you, you think about you're a nurse, and um, you're, you're working with a patient that's about to die. And you, maybe they were conscious whenever they first came in, and you're talking with their family. The last thing you want to do is to pick up the phone and call this organization and say, my patient's dying, you know, uh, you know, start getting the organs, you know, getting ready to line people up. And so they wait for the very last moment that they can because they don't think. I mean, they're, they're humans and, you know, they're, they're thinking about the, the flesh in front of them and, you know, they're just not thinking about uh, this abstract patient or these dozens of abstract patients out there they'll never see at other facilities. And it's just really unfair that we ask caregivers to do this. You know, they're really busy. You know, they don't have enough time for this. And then the emotional side of it that we're putting on them. So this is one, you know, really proud of because, you know, we're going to take that burden away from the caregivers here. And as a result of this, four days earlier is the difference between an organ wasted and someone actually getting this. And so this is going to save just an incredible number of lives here. So, um... I mentioned that we got rushed to production in three weeks. Uh, so are we still running on garbage code that was uh, demoware and was proof of concept? And uh, the answer would have been yeah uh, <laughs> for a long time. And so, uh, and so, but we began this idea of the big rewrite. But when you have a system that can never take downtime and you've got millions of things in memory and all this, how do you do the big rewrite? How do you switch it out? And so we use the strangler pattern. And so it kind of looks like this. <laughs> so we are absolutely changing the wheels on the car as it's going down the road on this thing. And, uh, uh, but we came up with a cuter name than Strangler. Uh, we call this project Floaty. And so we, what we did is we wrote a second system and we deployed it on top of our other system. They were both out there. And so the way this would work is say we had uh, a patient actor, a mail room, and all these different components out there, uh, these green components. Uh, what we'd do is in a release, we'd push out uh, like a floaty component that would replace maybe the mail room or replace uh, a patient actor or something along this line. And then the next release, we would, it would become the thing that was working. And so this would give us this chance of A-B comparison. So we'd be, able to, we'd be able to feed both of the circles all the data and we could see, are they both behaving well? Is the new stuff behaving well? And so we had two running systems basically. And, and now at this point, we have replaced all of that green code, all of that legacy 2017 to 2020 code, and we are now entirely on floaty. We've entirely replaced our code base on this system that has not taken a millisecond of downtime. And so that's where we are in 2023. <laughs> and, 
and we're kind of uh, we're kind of at the end now. So uh, one a couple of just parting things. Uh, I want to say uh, you know absorb papers and conference talks. Uh, you know go out to papers we love. Become a member of that group. Read the papers. Hang out with folks at conferences and just ask and learn and and just share. And pursue long ideas. So the idea behind water park came to me uh, about 10 years before I got the chance to implement it. So I've been thinking about this problem for 10 years, and then I show up there. And, and the proofs went really well because I'd worked on it for 10 years for free. <laughs> and so, um, so um, and then I was able to convince, uh, you know, people over here that are crazy enough to join me, like, because they'd seen that I'd thought about this stuff for a while. So the pursue long ideas, uh, reinvent some wheels, and uh, find or create work that's meaningful. Special thanks to my uh, brilliant team at HCA. Uh, some of them are here. Uh, just a brilliant crew. And building um, Water Park has been the most fun, meaningful work of my career. And so I'm really, really thankful for that. Um, I don't know if we uh, hit me any time for questions. I don't, I'm sure I'm way over. I haven't really been keeping a look on the clock. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but if you'd like to be colleague 283,001, uh, send me an email here. And uh, uh, I'd like to hear from you.